Good afternoon, all participants. Welcome to the ASEAN IPR discussion series. We will be uh, beginning the discussion series momentarily while we are waiting for other participants to join the Zoom. Thank you very much for your patience. Excellencies, distinguished moderators, speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome back to another session of the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation discussion series. This afternoon's session will take up a theme that is close to my heart personally, but nonetheless equally important and interwoven. The protection and promotion of human rights for sustainable peace. It is always a monumental moment when a peace agreement is signed. But what happens afterwards is equally important. How is then the already hard fought and hard earned peace maintained? And how are the rights of the victims for those affected by conflict are rehabilitated? Even further, how can ASEAN and its members work together to ensure regional peace is maintained in order to fulfill the rights of its citizens? Like our institute that was established 10 years ago, the ASEAN leaders also adopted another important document the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, or the IHRD. They imbued their signatures to its accompanying document, which is the Phnom Penh Statement on the Adoption of the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. Committing into that, the implementation of the, committing that in the implementation of the declaration, that nothing shall fall short of the already universally accepted international human rights instruments. One article in the IHRD talks about the right to peace, now, a decade after the adoption of the HRD, we would like to see how this right has been fulfilled. First of all, I would like to take this chance to convey our gratitude and appreciation to the embassies of Ireland uh, and the embassy of Finland in Jakarta for their continued generous support to our institute's flag flagship program. Uh, these discussion series enables us to continue networking with like-minded organizations, dissect the latest discourses and share best practices regarding peace, conflict resolution, and reconciliation. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin today's discussion, I would like to invite the Executive Director of the ASEAN IPR, His Excellency I Gusti Agung Musaka Puja, to de uh, deliver brief welcoming remarks. Maidi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Kartika. Um, excellencies, distinguished moderator, um, speakers, dear friends, colleagues, quo faris, a Latin phrase um, literally means, where are you marching? Journey towards defining human rights in the ASEAN context has gone through a creative evolution. When we re revisit history, the word human rights is absent in the text of the 1967 Bangkok declarations, which created the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN. However, the ASEAN Charter has been a historic consensus in addressing human rights related issues, in particular on the establishment of an ASEAN human rights mechanism. But how far is ASEAN supportive of human rights? The relationship between duties and rights, including the debate on promotion and protection of human rights, is not a novel query. It has engaged the attention of legal and moral scholars for many years to address the promotion and protection of human rights in balance. 
it was expressed in the past that I quote, ASEAN should view human rights in a positive light and not adopt a defensive attitude. Following the Second World Conference on Human Rights in Vienna in June 1993, ASEAN reaffirmed its commitment to and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms as set out in the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action 1993. It was also stressed that human rights are interrelated and indivisible, comprising civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. These rights are of equal importance. They should be addressed in a balanced and integrated manner and protected and promoted with due regard for specific cultural, social, economic, and political circumstances. But where are we now? Since the Vienna Declaration was adopted in June 1993, the promotion aspect has been given more prerogative than the protection. It has been almost 30 years by now that we have been in comfort zone in addressing promotional aspect of human rights. But if we make a flashback, actually the phrase protection and promotion, which emphasized the protection first uh, before the promotion, was pronounced at the paragraph 17 of the joint communique of the 26th ASEAN ministerial meeting in Singapore in July 1993. Further, if you recall, on the occasions of the 15th ASEAN summit in Thailand in October 2009, the ASEAN leaders adopted Cha'am Huahin declarations on the Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. Paragraph seven of the declaration clearly made reference on protection and promotion of human rights. With these backgrounds and taking into consideration of the current human rights circumstances and challenges faced by our regions. There is no compelling reason to shy away in addressing human rights protection. It is pertinent that today we discuss protection and promotion of human rights and how it gives impact to the sustainability of peace in our regions. Excellencies, dear colleagues and friends, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the third session of the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation Discussion Series. I'm grateful for everyone's participation in today's discussion, in particular to the moderator and speakers. The ASEAN IPR is so proud to have such prominent resource person in the field of human rights for today's discussions. My good and longtime friend, uh, RP Santiago and our moderator, as our moderator uh, Mr. Fabian um, Salfioli uh, from uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Dr. Sri Papa, and also my colleague, uh, Ms. Yuyun Wahyuningrum, as our uh, speakers. Today's uh, session aims to deliberate the um, inalienable uh, correlations between human rights and sustainable peace. In other words, there would be no real peace without clear respect and protection towards human rights. It is common that conflict often provides um, fertile ground for violation of human rights, such as condition could pose a serious obstacles in creating an inclusive post-conflict building framework. With this in mind, it should be considered that the value of a sustainability peaceful society would lie not only through peace agreement, but to extent in which the rights and dignity for every human being are protected and restored in its entirety um, on the peace agreement um, implementations. To put it um, another way, human rights and peace are two sides of the same coin, and the road towards sustainable coexistence and harmony cannot choose and pick between rights. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights sets out fundamental 
human rights to be universally protected. It has paved the way for the adoptions of various human rights treaties apply today on a permanent basis at global and regional levels, including ASEAN for Southeast Asia. Article one of the ASEAN Charter sets forth uh, the purposes of ASEAN, including among others, uh, first to maintain and enhance peace, security and stability and further strengthen peace-oriented values in the region and second to strengthen democracy, enhance good governance and the rule of law and to promote and protect human rights and fundamental freedoms. Furthermore, the ASEAN leaders in 2012 adopted the ASEAN Human Rights Declarations. Article 38 of the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration states that every person and the peoples of ASEAN have the right to enjoy peace in the ASEAN framework of security and stability. Furthermore, the article underlined that ASEAN member states should continue to enhance friendship and cooperation in the furtherance of peace, harmony, and stability in the region. It is through such foundations that the ASEAN APR is committed to uh, ensure that its work on peace would not be in silo from ASEAN's protections and promotions of human rights and fundamental freedoms. Under its term of reference, the ASEAN APR functioned as ASEAN's institutions for research, capacity building, creations of pool of expertise, um, networking, and disseminate um, information. Furthermore, activities undertaken by ASEAN APR aims to bring various additional perspectives, including gender, youth, as well as human rights in the regional work on peace building, conflict management, and conflict resolutions. Hence, today's discussion is a part of the Institute's work in providing space to share knowledge and expertise and to deliberate the interchangeably a bonded relationship between sustainable peace and the protections of human rights. This year, Excellencies, dear colleagues, the ASEAN APR marks its 10 years um, of its existence. I do not think it's a coincidence that the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration also celebrates its first decade this year, once again solidifying that human rights and peace should work hand in hand together. I wish to underline that the ASEAN APR stands ready to work together with the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, ASEAN Committee on Women, ASEAN Commissions on the Promotion and Protection of the Rights of Women and Children, ASEAN Committee on the Implementations of the ASEAN Declarations on the Protection and Promotion of the Rights of Migrant Workers, ASEAN Senior Officials Meeting on Transnational Crime, as well as all ASEAN bodies relevant to the protection and promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the regions. I hope that upon completion of today's discussion, we would gain insight that would be beneficial for the regional efforts in addressing challenges to human rights, which would thus raise sustainable peace um, in the regions. Before concluding, as we are still in the spirit of ASEAN Day, I would like to wish all my fellow ASEAN citizens a happy 55th ASEAN Day, and may um, our regions continue to grow as a peaceful and prosperous regions. Peace certainly is not the calm before the storm, and peace is not a one-stop bias. Like human rights, peace is a continuous process and journey. But where are we going to go? Quo Vadis. Thank you and have a product, productive discussion. Thank you to Executive Director Puja. Uh,
Thank you, sir. Um, I would now like to request for a group photo of our executive director with the moderator and all speakers. For the group photo, I seek the assistance of our colleagues from the ASEAN IPR Secretariat. I will count off to the count of three. One, two, three. Once more, please. One, two, three. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask your indulgence once again, uh, as this is the part where I need to relay some house rules to ensure everybody's comfort in following the discussion. So today's discussion will be around two and a half hours long. The event is simultaneously live streamed on the ASEAN IPR YouTube channel. Please ensure that you have steady internet connection and the updated version of the Zoom software as well. During the presentation from the speakers, attendees in Zoom who wish to pose a question to the speakers may use the Q&A box, while viewers on the YouTube channel can write their questions in the live chat box. Please follow the format of question as explained by the organizers in the chat box. Please refrain from using the chat or message box function on both platforms for personal or extensive discussions. And we ask that all participants be polite and considerate in their messages. Thank you for respecting these house rules. Ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, Attorney Ray Paulo Santiago, Executive Director of Ateneo Human Rights Center and the Secretary General of the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism. He is a lecturer of the School of Law in the Ateneo de Manila University and a, and a lawyer with the Ateneo Human Rights Center since 2001 until 2011, uh, until which he became the executive director of the HRC. Now, Attorney Santiago has been involved in the field of human rights, both at the national and regional level for several decades now. Uh, regionally, uh, from June to November 2007, Attorney Santiago was the legal consultant and member of the Philippine delegation to the high-level task force on the drafting of the ASEAN Charter, and between June 2008 to October 2009, he was the member of the Philippine delegation to the high level panel on the drafting of the terms of reference for, for an ASEAN human rights body, now more commonly known as the ICHAR. Since 2001, Attorney Santiago is also a part of the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism, or the Working Group, and the Philippine Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism, becoming its Secretary General since 2011. Lastly, he is also the recipient of the Freedom Flame Award given by the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom in 2014, as well as the recipient of the ASEAN People's Award in 2015, awarded at the 27th ASEAN Summit. Without further ado, Sir RP, I now hand over the discussion to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kartika. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good day for those who are viewing this live stream outside the Southeast Asian region. I'm very excited to hear from our very esteemed panelists uh, for this afternoon. In the opening remarks, we heard our good friend, the Executive Director of the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, Pak Pulja, talking about two concepts that are very important in the region, sustainable peace and human rights. Uh, I will not go back to uh, his background on uh, ASEAN and human rights, but definitely in this discussion this afternoon, we will be uh, looking at how concrete is ASEAN's commitment to sustainable peace and human rights. We'll be talking about these concepts, we'll be talking about the conditions, maybe some prerequisites, uh, how do we concretize the work that needs to be done? What is the struggle and the journey in attaining these concepts in mind? With that, let me go and introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is a human rights lawyer and professor. He has a PhD on juridical sciences and a master's degree on international relations. He is the current holder of um, mandate holder as Special Rapporteur on the Promotion of Truth, Justice, Reparation, and Guarantees of Non-Recurrence. As an academic, 
Our speaker is a professor of international law and human rights at the School of Law of the University of La Plata, where he is also the director of the Human Rights Masteral Program and director of the Institute of Human Rights. He has lectured in many countries and universities across the Americas, Europe, Asia, and here in Asia. And he has authored several books and articles on international human rights law, including on the United Nations human rights mechanisms, the inter-American human rights system, reparations, interpretation and application of human rights principles and international justice. He was a member of the UN Human Rights Committee from 2009 and 2016 and became its president from 2015 to 2016. And in that capacity, he authored the guidelines on reparations, which had been adopted by the committee in October 2016. Not only is our speaker a notable professor, he has also been litigating before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. He also filed the first amicus curiae brief on the right to torture, or right to truth, rather, before the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. He has several honorary titles in recognition of his work in the fields of human rights and education, including Honorary Professor of the University of Buenos Aires, Honorary Professor of the National University of La Pampa, Illustrious Graduate of the National University of La Plata, Illustrious Citizen of the City of La Plata, and the out and outstanding personality of the province of Buenos Aires. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce Professor Fabian Salvioli. Sir, you have 15 minutes to deliver your lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good morning <laughs> from me to, to all of you. It's four o'clock uh, in the morning here in, in Argentina. It is my real pleasure to participate in this in this event and let me to congratulate the Asian Institute for Peace and Reconciliation for organizing this relevant meeting and it's uh, great for me to join this uh, 10th anniversary commemorative uh, activities. Um, as you know, the promotion and protection of uh, human rights is a very relevant issue. But it's not a politic issue. It's a duty. These are obligations disclosed from the um, UN Charter and from the uh, relevant instrument of human rights adopted in the UN, the International Civil and Political Rights Covenant, the International Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Covenant. And most of Asian countries have ratified these both instruments and um, are part, of course, of the United Nations, our member states. So I would like to start uh, saying clearly that the promotion and protection of human rights are two obligations, duties, and not political wills. Um, I am now the special rapporteur uh, on the promotion of truth, justice, reparations, and warranties of non recurrences of the UN um, is the mandate uh, known as uh, <clears throat> transitional justice. So how to deal with the, with the past. Transitional justice is uh, more or less the full range of processes and mechanisms uh, associated, uh, established, for dealing with the large scale past abuses uh, in order to ensure uh, accountability, self justice, and achieve reconciliation. 
So the elements of uh, my mandate is um, are um, large scale abuses. Hmm? That means serious or systematic violations of human rights or uh, and uh, international humanitarian law. Transition, that means um, one transition from an authoritarian regime to a democratic regime, to a democratic one, the rule of law, um, um, or exit uh, of an armed conflict, internal or international armed conflict to the democracy or to the peace. Um, and uh, processes and mechanisms uh, are all of them must be in the framework of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. It's particular principles and of course, the pro persona perspective. That means in the most favorable way of protection of human rights. I identified five pillars in my task, five pillars um, for the mandate. Truth, justice, reparations, warranties of non-recurrences, and memorialization processes. And a transitional justice process should be designed in full consultation with the victims. The active participation of the victims from the design to the implementation of the process. So, of course, victim-centered approach and other elements and uh, as a gender perspective are cross-cutting issues for my job. But promoting and protecting human rights is not just for a transitional justice process. It's a duty. It's a duty. It's a national duty and it's an international duty. Which is the purpose of one state in the 21st cycle? To promote and protect human rights without discrimination. That is the main duty of the state according national constitution and is also the main objective for the international organizations regional and united nations it is true that when the un charter was adopted, it was a division, artificial division between human rights and to maintain international peace and security. If we see the first article of the UN Charter, the first objective, the first purpose, purpose is to maintain international peace and security. And this purpose is attributed to the Security Council. As all of us, we know, Security Council is composed by 15 members and five members have the veto power and other exceptional powers. 
So the power, the power in the, in the at the UN Security Council is concentrated. The third, the third purpose of the UN is to achieve international cooperation for the promotion and protection of human rights. And this goal is attributed to the uh, ECOSOC, to the Economic, Social and Cultural um, Council. And the power in this council is deconcentrated. The machinery of human rights have, has many bodies. We have 10 treaty bodies, 10 committees, and the subcommittee for prevention of torture, 45 special procedures, geographic and thematic ones like my mandate. So the power is not concentrated. During the first uh, half cycle, after the adoption of the UN Charter, promotion and protection of human rights and sustained peace were not joined. But that was a fail. It is not possible human rights without peace, and it is not possible peace without human rights and without justice. So, for a real peace, for building each day peace, for accomplish the obligation of the um, national and international public policy, human rights is the tool. There is no peace without justice and there is no peace without human rights. But when we have a large scale um, of abuses or violations of human rights on international humanitarian law, the following process must, and I highlight, must have these five elements. Truth. And for that, Truth Commission, with enough human and economic resources, and with a very good staff for receiving testimonies and for producing a report, a credible report. Because the truth is a right of the victims, is a right of the families, and is a right of the society. And this truth is relevant for the future, is indispensable for the future. Of course, justice. Impunity is a serious problem and is a challenge for peace. I presented uh, two years ago a report about accountability and um, transitional justice process to the Human Rights Council. It is not possible impunity. So amnesties are not valid. We should prosecute and punish 
the perpetrators of the most serious crimes. Because if not, the peace is not possible. Sometimes we confuse reconciliation with impunity. But it's exactly the opposite. For reconcile the society, we need the justice to recover the trust, and that is reconciliation. Recover the trust between the society and the state. And for recovering the trust, we need to prosecute and punish the perpetrators. Of course, reparations. And reparations means full reparation. Not just economic compensation. Measures of rehabilitations, especially with heinous crimes like, like uh, torture, enforced disappearances uh, for the families of the victims, sexual abuses. Measures of rehabilitations are fundamental. Measures of satisfaction. That means public apologies. I also presented a report on apologies uh, four years ago to the Human Rights Council. Gender perspective. I presented also a report on gender perspective to the General Assembly of the UN two years ago. And of course, warranties of non recurrences. And that means the adoption of all legal measures and to revise and change security sector reform, especially in um, some areas, is very difficult to establish a democratic process. In my visits to El Salvador or to the Gambia, I unfortunately uh, saw so the resistances in the army or in the security sector reform, the security sector for having a, a real and democratic reform. And that is a problem. We can have a democratic society if armed forces are not democratic. And finally, memorialization. Memorialization process are fundamental for the future. Transitional justice is not dealing with the past, it's dealing with the future. In my last visit to the Balkans, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Serbia, and other countries in the region, my preliminary remarks after the visit are clear. In that countries, we have accountability because we have the um, International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and local mechanisms of accountability. But the memorialization process failed. And now, 25 or 30 years ago, perpetrators of atrocities are considered heroes. So the future in that region is endangered, in danger. So, 
It is not possible. Peace without human rights. We can discuss if peace is a human rights or is just a right. That is a possible discussion. But it's clear that without peace, there is no human rights. And without human rights, there is no peace. And these five elements, truth, justice, reparations, warranties of non-recurrences, and memorialization processes, our duties is not pick and choose one element. And that are obligations disclosed from the UN Charter, from the International Covenants of Human Rights and Asian countries have ratified this general covenant. And are the main purpose of the public policy. So we need to rethink the UN Charter and consider promotion and protection of human rights as part of the maintain international peace and security objective. So I'm very happy to participate here. I congratulate to all of you for this initiative. I'm sure the Asian region has a terrible potential to enrich the international community from the perspective of human rights, as Asian countries did during the building of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Because many, many professors participated in the process, even if not many countries have been part of the UN at that time. So um, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you very much, Professor Salvioli, particularly on discussing the need to move from concepts of uh, human rights justice to something that is more concrete in sharing with us the five elements that you think would lead towards an effective transitional justice and that the five elements again are truth, justice, reconciliation, reparations, and uh, memorialization. Thank you. Our next speaker is, uh, I'm excited actually to introduce our next speaker simply because I've uh, known her for a long time and is a very good friend. Uh, she's one of my favorite activists in the region, human rights activists in the region, very passionate. And her previous roles have prepared her for her role right now in ASEAN. She used to be campaign coordinator, program manager, program officers on issues such as human rights within ASEAN, uh, children's issues, particularly on trafficking in persons and child labor, as well as uh, human rights Operation, operationalization of human rights within ASEAN. Currently, she is a co-founder of Weave, Weaving Women's Voices in Southeast Asia. She is also the co-founder of Southeast Asia's Initiative for Human Rights Accountability and is the Senior Advisor on ASEAN and Human Rights of Human Rights Working Group that is based in Jakarta. She has a master's degree on human rights from Mahidol University, and she is a PhD candidate at the Global Governance Law and Social Justice at the International Institute of Social Studies in The Hague, 
Erasmus University, Rotterdam. She is currently representative of Indonesia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Human Rights. Her Excellency, Ms. Wayuning Room, but she's more popularly, or popularly known as Yuyun. Excellency, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, RP. Thank you for a generous uh, introduction. Uh, thank you very much for having me uh, in this important uh, discussion series. And I would like to congratulate the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation of having the series of discussion, which is very, very meaningful. I've attended uh, some of them and I've been um, inspired and I learned a lot from the series of discussion. Um, in I in preparing my talk, uh, I realized I will be I will be going here and there, so I decided to come up with the PowerPoint presentations to uh, to systematize my presentation. So uh, okay, so first let me uh, share the screen. Okay, uh, oh not this one, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Okay, so the um, uh, the the topic that given to me or to all of us is quite uh, wide, and I'm happy that the organizer sent me the guided questions, and it it has been very useful uh, to guide me on uh, uh, to frame my my talk. But first, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, or ICER. Apologies for if this information is redundant, but for those who haven't, haven't yet engaging the ICER, that's how we call it, um, or have not even hear about uh, the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, I hope this information will be useful. So it is the body that was established by the charter article 14 uh, in 2009. So it is a, it, it is a charter body. The ICER is got, the work of ICER is guided by its term of reference, which has 14 mandates and uh, ASEAN human rights declaration. It has 10 uh, representative from 10 ASEAN member states. The purposes of ASEAN, uh, I think I highlighted here, is to uh, promote and protect human rights and to uphold the right of the peoples of ASEAN to live in peace, dignity, and prosperity. So we can see here the connection that was established by ASEAN is that the implementation of rights, the fulfillment of rights is to, for the purpose of uh, making people living in peace, dignity, and prosperity. So the idea of human rights and peace always come together uh, in this case. I will also go into the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, which locate peace is the condition for human rights uh, to be exercised. So that's the relations uh, of peace and human rights as uh, presented by the term of reference of ICER, as well as the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. But more importantly, that I would like to uh, also highlight here is that the ICER uh, role is to complement national and international efforts on the promotion and protection of human rights. So we see our role is to complement rather than compete or replace uh, the mechanism at the national or international level. And this is the areas, uh, the, the area that we can uh, come together uh, in cooperation and coordination. ICER work, uh, ICER report to ASEAN foreign ministers meeting every year, usually every July or uh, uh, August. Uh, according to, to the TOR, ICER meet uh, twice in a year, but now becoming regular four times in a year. ICER uh, follows the way ASEAN works, uh, following the consensus, consultation, consultative, uh, it is consultative body, and it is also intergovernmental body, and also uh, ICER observe the non-interference principle. I mentioned earlier that ICER has uh, 14 uh, mandates that I try to make it uh, rather succinct into, uh, uh, to group into uh, six areas. 
standard setting, cooperation, policy support, protection, human rights strategy, research and capacity building, dialogue and engagement. So if you ask me what is the role of ICER in relation to upholding the right of migrant workers on trafficking in person, on uh, freedom of uh, religion and belief, so we can tap into this kind of categories, uh, standard setting, ICER has responsibility to come up with the standards, regional standards on freedom of religion and belief, for instance, or human rights strategy on freedom of peaceful, peaceful assembly or research and capacity building in relation to trafficking in person. So these, these are some illustration, but I hope this is uh, easier for many people to, 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 to realize and imagine what kind of body of uh, ICER is uh, for the region. So now I go to the topic on human rights, peace, and uh, conflict resolution. I agree uh, on what have been uh, uh, presented by a special rapporteur uh, in relation and in, in relation of uh, human rights and 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 also peace and uh, conflict resolution. And we have been uh, hearing this uh, uh, statements that human rights may be considered as a causes, symptoms, and consequences or even the means either to transform the violent conflict or to perpetuate it. So we have been hearing this a lot. Uh, also that uh, the statement on human rights violation may, be, uh, may also be perpetuated through denial of humanitarian relief and destruction of civilians' livelihoods. The persistence of human rights violation in protected uh, conflict setting can also serve as a driving factors that deepen divisions and animosity among parties in conflict. This done in this has been written down in number of research um, uh, mentioned in multilateral uh, forum uh, in discussion and so on and so forth. But in reality, very often human rights are perceived as stumbling block in achieving peace and conflict resolution. It happened here in our region. It happened in a number of areas. The, the dangerous have been mentioned by the uh, special rapporteur is very clear. No human rights without peace, with, uh, no peace without human rights, but still human rights continue to be the stumbling block, continue to be seen as burden. In fact, human rights perspective can provide a set of standards, principles, and values that often guide the design and implementation of conflict resolution strategies and processes. Human rights approach is needed uh, uh, for the process of conflict resolution by providing normative legal framework, structural condition and for peace and reconciliation, participation and inclusion, and accountability and redress. During the, the last uh, uh, ICHR and, SC, uh, MM, ICHR and ASEAN foreign ministers meeting uh, in Phnom Penh just, just, not, just now, I mean, in, in, in August, in uh, early August, I, I mentioned this, uh, I call for the uh, attention uh, on uh, using human rights perspective in the current political crisis in Myanmar. So, because it has been uh, repetitively happened in the region. So uh, it is time for ASEAN to really look at human rights or include human rights in their uh, approaches to political crisis or conflict resolution. In ICER, uh, ASEAN Human Rights Declaration has mentioned about uh, right to enjoy peace. Article 18 of ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, uh, the text was, I think, inspired by the general, by the text of General Assembly Declaration on the Right to Peace of 2016. Similar, almost similar text, but the way um, ASEAN or uh, the way ASEAN uh, engage with peace is through the right, in, in terms of human rights, is the right to enjoy peace. So what we can understand from this text, Peace is preconditioned to enable other rights to be fulfilled and exercised. It enables individuals and groups. As you can see, the text use every person and the peoples. So it, it actually convey the idea of this is individual rights as well as the collective rights. It's also a uh, right to enjoy peace is in an enabling right, which without it, uh, other rights cannot be uh, exercised or, or other rights will be undermined. The discussion about human rights always corresponded with set obligation. To what extent the right to enjoy peace 
provide uh, uh, state obligation in relation to uh, respecting, protecting, and fulfilling the right to enjoy peace. At least at at, uh, for this uh, uh, particular text, we may be uh, interpret that uh, 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 the text uh, convey the state obligation to maintain and promote peace, to take necessary measures to ensure the right holders to enjoy peace, uh, 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 ways uh, of how to improve cooperation has been mentioned here in the text uh, through friendship, uh, through uh, cooperation for furtherance of peace, harmony, and stability in the region. And uh, um, the state is obliged, not the state is not obliged, the state is obliged to encourage and create environment, sorry, that's typo, <laughs> environment that promote peace, for instance, to ensure good governance uh, implemented human rights, uh, uh, as well as the respect for human dignity and promote social justice for its citizen. And it is uh, the text also mentioned about or can be understood that the right holders are entitled to benefit from peace. Uh, right to enjoy uh, peace or right to enjoy enjoy uh, something in the international uh, law uh, has a number of uh, different meanings. Uh, at least uh, UDHR, the uh, ICCP or ICS, ICESR, Refugee Convention, as well as the Vienna Declaration of Human Rights, the Vienna Declaration of Program of Action, mention about the right followed with the enjoy, right to right and enjoy, and, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the texts that uh, we collected uh, uh, to to mention that uh, the how right to enjoy can be can be understood. At least uh, from uh, Refugee Convention, we can learn that. Uh, Article 14 mentioned about everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy asylum from persecution in the other countries. The right to enjoy asylum suggests the minimum right to benefit from asylum, while the state not obli not obligated to uh, grant asylum. Once the person granted grant with the asylum, he or she uh, should be able to enjoy uh, this kind of rights. So, so this is only just to provide the similarity of, of how uh, the word right to enjoy has been used in international human rights law. ICER has come up with study on the right, uh, right to enjoy peace. This is a bottom-up approach to formulate definition, interpretation, norm, and standards. I mentioned here uh, some of the experiences and practices at the ASEAN member states. It has more than four countries here. I just would like to uh, give the uh, illustration that the study uh, is more bottom up, using bottom up approach, taking the experiences of uh, other countries. Uh, the study also mentioned about some tentative definition about right to enjoy peace. It also talk about the entitlement uh, uh, to be considered in the right to peace. Uh, and the essence of rights, as well as disruption of peace. Uh, the, the study has not yet published, so I uh, reluctant to discuss <laughs> further on this, but once it is uh, published, uh, I think IHR will be able to explore uh, possibilities. Uh, the study also discuss about the difference between uh, right to peace versus uh, the right to enjoy peace. Uh, the right to enjoy peace, according to the scholars uh, uh, in the study, does not make a subject of direct rights. Therefore, there is no corresponding 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 set obligation to it. Beneficiaries, however, have the right to request the provision to enjoy enjoy it if granted. But this this we are still under discussion uh, among the uh, researchers. Uh, in the study, uh, we have not been able to arrive at the finalization of the study. But this, just to give you the dynamic of uh, discussion in relation to the right to uh, enjoy peace. Uh, but before finalizing the study, ICER has a number of uh, 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 ideas uh, on how to continue uh, the discussion uh, after post the, the 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 research, such as to develop interpretation and recommendation of Article 30, 38 of the ASEAN uh, Human Rights Declaration, 
after the adoption of ASEAN Human Rights Declaration, it is the uh, the, the responsibility of ICER to promote and to provide uh, interpretation for the purpose of providing recommendation for implementation of specific articles. Therefore, a number of initiatives right now in ICER uh, were guided by articles uh, in the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. Uh, also, uh, in our five-year work plan, uh, the uh, uh, the training, the capacity building, uh, human rights and peace education mentioned very prominently uh, in support to uh, right to peace, right to enjoy peace. A uh, number of ongoing projects relevant to uh, right to enjoy peace is about right to remedy, in which we talk about reparation, we talk about uh, uh, um, that man uh, right to truth, right to victims, as mentioned by special rapporteur, it is the implementation of Article 5, which or promote the, uh, the 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 realization of right to enjoy peace. We also talk about prevention of torture. Prevention of torture has been the regular uh, uh, activities and project in ICER. We would like to change the behavior and practices of uh, uh, security apparatus not to use torture to obtain information. Uh, freedom of religion and belief is also uh, uh, one of our project. Uh, all of them uh, uh, supported uh, to the idea of uh, enjoyment of the peace. Um, in 2023, uh, we also plan to have uh, human rights and policy. Uh, last year, actually, we have the uh, pol community policing approach to prevent trafficking in person. Uh, the project has been uh, uh, um, welcomed by a lot of security apparatus and we would like to uh, strengthen that kind of initiative to have a uh, human rights and policy. Uh, in terms of institutional building in ICER, uh, because if we talk about peace uh, and sustainable peace and human rights, we need to have a mechanism in which dialogue as one of the mechanism uh, to maintain peace and dialogue as the methodology to, to maintain peace. Uh, in ICER, we have uh, adopted the complaint mechanism uh, to hear grievances from the people. And also we have the agenda item uh, to talk about specifically on human rights situation of other countries within our uh, 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 meeting in ICER. And we have uh, ASEAN Human Rights Dialogue in which the platform which ICER uh, have a dialogue with ASEAN member states in relation to the implementation of uh, ASEAN Human Rights Declaration. A number of uh, uh, initiatives that we plan to do until 2025, including Human Rights Index, referral system, uh, country visit, and so on and so forth. This is, well, I just would like to show the picture uh, of how we did the ASEAN Human Rights Dialogue in 2021. This is the second, the first was uh, in 2013. Uh, and now, because of COVID nineteen, we we've done that. We, we've done this uh, in hybrid format, and it was uh, quite successful. Uh, uh, eight out of ten member states share their human rights uh, issues as well as recommendations. And this is also a place in which uh, IG representative or other ASEAN uh, member state ask question to other member states uh, on their uh, human rights issues. And this is uh, the picture of the last uh, uh, ASEAN Foreign Ministers meeting interface with ICER, in which we discuss about number of uh, sensitive issues uh, on in relation to human rights uh, and seeking for mandates because Article 4.14 in the TOR mentioned about that ICER uh, should be should implement whatever whatever ASEAN Foreign Ministers ask ICER to do. Uh, well, that's paraphrase, but uh, that's basically the 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 idea. So so this is a cl quite close meeting, uh, but this is the time in which foreign ministers uh, receive reports from us. ICER uh, report to report to them and ask for main or more mandates as well as sharing our concerns. Some of the human rights issues uh, in the region was also discussed and receive uh, uh, responses from the foreign ministers. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yuyun. Uh, consistent with our theme of moving from concept 
to concrete steps, uh, Yuyun has shown us the framework of uh, human rights promotion and protection within ASEAN by giving us a background of the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. But more than just remaining as an ICHER, Yuyun has also showed us concrete steps of how our topic for today, peace and human rights, are not only discussed, uh, but essentially she discussed how to move towards the right to enjoy uh, these rights. I now move to our third speaker. Our third speaker is, is a teacher to all of us. I'm also very proud and excited to introduce our third speaker. Uh, she's a teacher to all of us. She's also a professor. Uh, she's the current advisor to the Institute of Human Rights and Peace Studies at Mahidol University, but has been uh, guiding the Institute for decades now. Uh, in fact, our next speaker was also the Thai representative to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. Uh, when it was established in 2009, she actually was the chair of the ICHER uh, when it was first established. She's an expert as well uh, locally in Thailand and is a member of the or was a member of the Human Rights Subcommittee of the National Human Rights Commission. She has been the convener for decades of the ASEAN University Network, the Human Rights Education Committee, and is the chair of the Strengthening Human Rights and Peace Research and Education in ASEAN, or what is called the Shape C. She is also the advisor of the International Organization for Migration, particularly as part of the research and publishing high-level advisors of IOM and the advisor to the Coalition for the Protection of the Rights of, of Asylum Seekers, Refugees, and Stateless Persons. Uh, she's an example of an, acad an activist academic uh, who's been using the academe uh, in order to discuss a lot of ideas, but bringing these ideas into the concrete world and moving and uh, asking for accountability from many governments uh, in order to ensure that human rights are not only promoted, but they are protected, not only in Thailand, but here in Southeast Asia. It is my pleasure to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Sriprapa Pecharamesri. Ajarn. Thank you. Thank you very much, RP, for a uh, very uh, nice and elaborated in introduction. Um, I, um, I feel a bit um, awkward with, yeah, with, with such a nice introduction, but thank you so much indeed. Uh, very good afternoon. Um, congratulations to the AIPR for its uh, 10th anniversary. Um, I would like to thank uh, the Institute for having me on the panel regarding promotion and protection of human rights for sustainable peace. Um, the topic itself is important and requires careful further thoughts and discussions uh, within the ASEAN region, uh, where debates on the contribution of um, human rights to peace and development are more or less absent, in my opinion. Um, I have to um, I have to, uh, to warn that my discussion would be quite you know, straightforward as usual as an academic. I was requested to discuss five questions and uh, I'll be trying to go one by one. Um, I'm not sure if I can address all of them within 15 minutes um, that are allocated to me, but I'll try my best. I would like to begin by looking at the causal relationships between human rights and sustainable peace that have been recognized at international level. Uh, in 2016, the General Assembly and the Security Council adopted resolutions that broadened the United Nations approach to peace building to ensure that it addressed the root causes of conflict and crisis and uh, focuses on sustaining peace. In February 2017, the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, in his address to Human Rights Council, was stating, and I quote, perhaps 
the best the best prevention tool we have is a universal declaration of human rights and the three things that derive from it the rights set out in it identify many of the root causes of conflict but equally they provide real world solutions to real change on the ground end of the quote he reiterated similar messages in his address to the UN Security Council in April 2017, uh, saying that human rights are, and I quote, a critical foundation for sustaining peace. He observed that upholding human rights is a crucial element of prevention, and human rights are intri intrinsically linked to sustaining peace. Um, peace has traditionally been seen as an international matter with the definition of peace limited to the absence of war or conflict. Uh, that is uh, what Joan Gaudung called negative peace. This is clearly, clearly reflected in the ASEAN Human Rights Declaration as, uh, as Excellency Yu Yun has already mentioned here, which is, which is Article uh, 38. Um, I would like to reiterate here uh, that the article state, and I quote, everyone and, and the peoples of ASEAN have the right to enjoy peace within an ASEAN framework of security and stability, neutrality and freedom, such that the rights set forth in this declaration can be fully realized. To this end, ASEAN member states should continue to enhance friendship and cooperation in the furtherance of peace, harmony and stability in the region. The article attempts to cover many things. The essence is that peace in this article has been seen from international and regional security perspective, focusing on friendly relationships and cooperation among member states in keeping harmony and stability. This article does not include another aspect of peace, meaning positive peace, that includes the condition needed for, for lasting peace it is clear that the absence of fulfillment of economic, social, and cultural rights is a major cause of non-peace. Poverty caused violence, crimes, migrations, and conflict over resources while respecting for human rights and freedom of individuals and, and peoples as well as rule of law are essential for peaceful and resilient societies. I'm glad to hear from Excellency Yu Yun that um, uh, in the Aisha thematic study on right to peace, the concept was expanded and elaborated to cover other aspects of rise to peace. Uh, Christopher Barbe, an academic from Switzerland wrote in his article entitled Links Between Peace, Democracy and Human Rights, that how a person or an institution defies peace will have a direct effect on the way issues of peace are addressed. I would like to add that how a person or an institution such as ASEAN perceives human rights will have a direct effect on the way human rights are practiced and addressed, including how human rights regime is designed for the region. Now I come to the question. The first question that I got was, is that if the current ASEAN cooperation in protecting human rights has been effective? My answer is not quite and not yet. More than 10 years after the establishment of the AISHA, there are ever increasing criticism of its ineffectiveness in protecting the rights of ASEAN, of ASEAN peoples. Despite efforts made by some AISHA representatives, the AISHA as an institution has been constrained by the lack of independence in discharging their mandates and functions due to the appointment and composition, having no clear mandates to perform protection Although now we heard they're trying to clarify, including receiving and investigating human rights violations, uh, the absence of institutional support for the IHR and the voluntary basis of the work of representatives who are not full-time, all present major institutional challenges for the IHR. Kasit Piromia, uh, who is the former Thai Prime Minister confirmed and I quote, IJR's term of reference prevents it from effectively protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms. Its mandate is too weak and broad, and there are no monitoring and complaint mechanisms, nor is it mandated to carry out any country fact finding missions or peer reviews of ASEAN's human rights record, end of the quote. What has been the biggest challenge for the ASEAN countries in terms of protecting human rights and to create inclusive 
sustainable peace? My answer, I think the biggest challenge is for ASEAN member states in protecting human rights and creating sustainable peace are related to how human rights is perceived. Human rights are perceived by ASEAN member states as controversial. In one of his address to a forum that the Working Group for an ASEAN Human Rights Mechanism organized in Singapore in 2008, Tommy Cole, the Singaporean ambassador at large, said, and I quote, there was no issue that took up uh, more of our time, no issue as controversial and which divided us in families so deeply as human rights. He actually referred to the contentious discussions over the inclusion of human rights and fundamental freedoms, as well as the establishment of an ASEAN human rights system in the ASEAN Charter, although finally we got it. Human rights are seen as politically sensitive and politicized. When the members attempt to shield their allies from the scrutiny of the body or prevent any serious human rights violation, human rights abuses to be discussed and addressed. In ASEAN, linking human rights to, sustaining, to, to, to sustainable peace could be challenging if states feel that they are being selectively targeted or that they are hidden political motives. Another challenge to human rights in general relates to the lack of enforcement and state use of the principle of sovereignty to justify their refusal or reluctance to engage on human rights. Despite these challenges, it remains as their best interest to uphold the rule of law and human rights if they envision sustainable peace. According to the Institute for Economics and Peace 2017 Global Peace Index, it was revealed that the most peaceful countries are those with the most solid human rights records. Why it is not to suggest a simple or linear relationship between upholding human rights and peace, the data indicates that violating or failing to uphold human rights does not sustain peace, so make society peaceful. We see this clearly in some members of ASEAN. With the social and economic, the third question I got, with the social and economic problems caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, how nation state or, really, or regional cooperation could incorporate human rights-based approach in its recovery framework. The COVID-19 affects people indiscriminately. However, the report issued by WHO in 2021 indicated that refugees and migrants have been disproportionately affected by both the direct effects of the COVID-19 pandemic and the restrictive migration measures put in place, which in turn have hampered coordinated and consistent public health responses. This is just about one group of populations. In fact, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the consequences of vulnerability with increased rates of infections and deaths among the poor and the disadvantaged. During the pandemic, vulnerable populations are disproportionately affected and the pre-existing vulnerabilities exacerbated and generated new form of vulnerability and discrimination. This is the critical human rights issue that we expect ASEAN to address. I'm sorry, my my uh, my camera, you know, automatically off, and I don't know how to address this. Um, how nation state or regional cooperation could incorporate human rights based approach in its recovery framework? A human rights based approach is based on four principles that Excellency Yujun has already mentioned: non-discrimination, inequality, participation, empowerment, and accountability. The human rights-based approach enhances transparency and accountability by public officials and consequently leads to good governance. It emphasizes accountability of those with duties and or obligations, and the obligation must be constantly checked. And we heard you know, the emphasis made by our first speaker. This implies monitoring and evaluating at all levels of the projects and programs. It cuts on inefficiencies and adopts effective approaches to program support. It requires the ability of the people to gain understanding and control over personal, social, economic, and political forces in order to take action to improve their life situations. It is the process by which individuals and communities are enabled to take 
power and act effectively in gaining greater control, efficacy, and social justice in changing their lives and their environment. I have quickly gone through the ASEAN Comprehensive Recovery, Recovery Framework adopted by ASEAN in 2020. The framework focuses on five broad strategies, namely enhancing health systems, strengthening human security, maximizing the potential of intra ASEAN market and broader economic integration, accelerate, accelerating inclusive digital transformation, and advancing towards a more sustainable and resilient future. In order to implement initiatives and programs, lead sectoral bodies were identified. The framework is identified as, uh, is definitely, in my opinion, an economic oriented, and as we always see in ASEAN, is in silo, unfortunately. Interestingly, the ACWC and the AISHA were identified as lead sectoral bodies under strengthening human security strategy. Initiatives and programs are mainly consultations and sharing best practices to come up with recommendations and documentation. The framework emphasizes the outputs, not the outcomes, which requires a process, which is the basis for a human rights-based approach. Incorporating human rights-based approach demands human rights monitoring, monitoring and analysis that can provide early warning of grievances, especially of vulnerable groups by empowering them. It is necessary to consider the full spectrum of rights, including political and civil rights and economic, social, or cultural rights. A human rights-based approach is about how we do and is the process based. It needs long-term allies, which means, which means that ASEAN will need to be a real people-centered organization, as stated in the ASEAN Vision 2025, rather than an elitist one where participation of all stakeholders is mostly absent. I do understand that ASEAN is not a human rights organization, but ASEAN needs a human rights, needs human rights within the institution and its bodies. There cannot be human rights-based community without individuals who have internalized human rights values. Here, promoting human rights and peace education to inculcating human rights and peace culture is imperative. Expanding constituencies beyond states and officials, as well as business entities, to include real multi-stakeholders, including civil societies, um, is the key to create a comprehensive network of cooperation between government, the government, and non-state actors to protect and to promote human rights. I would like to conclude by emphasizing on how to strengthen the AISHA in order for the body to work efficiently in holding ASEAN member states accountable. We have been pushing for, pushing for the review of the terms of reference of AISHA, which should have been con conducted five years after its establishment in 2009. It is equally important for the AISHA to creatively, I'm glad to hear earlier, creatively interpreting a few mandates and functions of the body to address pressing human rights issues. It is the ICH choice, in my opinion, to either, uh, to either be a strong body able to address civil rights abuses with the independent authority to make binding decisions or to remain merely a nominal body that serves as a meeting shop under the command of us in member states. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ajahn Sriprapa, for briefly answering many of the questions that had been um, given to the panelists in order to determine how to move forward on the issues of sustainable peace and human rights in the region. Uh, allow me to ask to open our question and answer portion of the program. Uh, we don't have any more our first speaker, uh, Professor Professor Salvioli uh, had to leave earlier uh, because it's already, um, I think, 4.30 in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning <laughs> in uh, Argentina at the moment. And when he started the program, it was a little before 4 o'clock. So he had to catch up with his rest. My earlier Ajarn Sriprapa mentioned that one of the biggest challenges at the moment uh, 
in ASEAN is how human rights is perceived. And one of our uh, one of our guests are actually asking, as far as uh, he or she knows, human rights is considered as inherent and universal, that we already have this. But why is it that it seems that human rights are given by the government and governments are allowed to revoke them? So how can we change these views here within ASEAN and uh, so that uh, ASEAN member states would consider that human rights are not given by them and cannot simply be taken away by them? Uh, who would like to go first? Would uh, Yuyun or Ajarn Surprapa like to go first with that? Ajarn? Yeah, I can go first. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. I saw quite of quite a number of questions in the Q&A coming from uh, more or less the same uh, person. Um, we don't see the list of participants here, so I don't have much idea who asked the questions, but uh, I'll be trying my best to um, address the question, which is uh, extremely important. Um, as RP has already mentioned, when we talk about human rights, the understanding is that human rights, we are born with rights. The rights are not given by, you know, by the government or by the states. Um, However, as the, um, the person who asked the question has observed, um, and this is one of the challenges that we are facing, in the sense that it's actually because states, uh, there are a few things that I would like to address here. The first one, human rights is about, uh, is about power relationships. And when we talk about power relationships here, um, it, the power is also in is always in balance, you know, between between the governments and the people. The government has, you know, all power, uh, not only to enact um, laws uh, to come up with the policies, uh, but also to enforce law. And by enforcing laws, you know, it 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 looks like that rights are given by the governments because uh, in many cases, human rights were actually incorporated in laws. Well, that which is, which is in a way is good, but it's not good when you know, the government is abusing the power, especially when enforcing the law. Um, the second thing, which I think is also important, not only um, the um, power imbalance and the fact that government has power to enforce the law, um, the government also has the uh, tangible powers in hand. When I say tangible powers at hand, I am referring to, for example, armed forces, police officers, and other you know, tools in order to enforce the law. Of course, it actually, it, uh, it, uh, um, it, it, just reinforce the, in the already existing imbalance of power. Um, I was reading this morning that, you know, the uh, budget that governments, that different governments in the world are, are spending on building um, armed forces and weapons is actually 10 times um, higher than um, than official development assistance. What does it mean? It means so many things, um, including you know, uh, who decide on the, um, the, on the use of budget. And of course, again, on the enforcing of the law. My last answer would be, um, I mentioned in my, in my talk that human rights education is extremely important. Human rights and peace education is extremely important. It's very unfortunate, as RP has already mentioned, that I um, that I was convening. I said I was convening the ASEAN um, University Network Human Rights and Peace Education. I finished my term uh, just last month, and um, I was replaced by a colleague of mine at Mahidol University. Um, over uh, at least from 2009 until uh, last month as a convener of the ASEAN uh, of the ASEAN University Network in Rice Education. 
we found out in quite a number of research that we have done that it is rare to see university thousand or ten thousand of university existing you know in this region offering human rights education and peace education programs or courses so it is a complete lack of of education. What does it mean by lack of education, human rights and peace education? It means that the people are not really empowered in order for them to, uh, to be able to defend their rights. Thank you. Thank you, Ajarn. I think um, I'll, I'll uh, sum up with what you said uh, at the end, that uh, knowledge, knowledge is power, Ajarn, given that there is an improper power or improper or there is an imbalance of power that's happening within the region as well uh yuyun may i ask uh, in in your role within aichur and in your opinion as a human rights activist who should be involved in the human rights promotion and protection in the region um, i know that you uh, mentioned the initiatives of aichur uh, but how can we make uh, human rights promotion and protection a reality within ASEAN? Uh, thank you very much, RP. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, if I may, I would like also to address the question earlier. Uh, uh, adding to what uh, 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 Ajahn Sripapa has mentioned, but human rights uh, has uh, different dimensions. They are derogable and non-derogable rights. Some rights uh, can be limited uh, by the limitation of rights require a number of uh, procedures. Uh, it should fulfill or satisfy the criteria of necessity, ne necessity, legality, and proportionality. And it has been very, very strict in the way uh, international law govern this kind of uh, ways to limit rights. But the reality, very often, uh, we, we also uh, witness how rights had been limited during COVID-19. Uh, the procedures had been used rather um, uh, uh, flexible uh, by the member state, which is very uh, unfortunate. Um, I think the, the role of uh, actors, uh, both from uh, state actors and non-state actors are very, very important. Civil society have uh, very uh, important and significant roles to monitor and to report uh, to uh, and share the responsibility of uh, educating uh, people about human rights. Uh, mechanism at the national and inter international uh, and uh, regional level play important role to, uh, to promote and protect uh, human rights. Uh, in in ITER, uh, our role has a number of dimension in terms of internally and externally. Internally inside ITER, inside uh, ASEAN, uh, ITER has responsibility to mainstream human rights. Uh, it is therefore, uh, we engage with different uh, ASEAN sectoral bodies to ensure that their work plan, their uh, activities, uh, consider human rights uh, into uh, as an approach. So, for instance, on uh, counter violent extremism, elimination of child labor, uh, protecting children uh, in the context of uh, migration, uh, trafficking in person, and so on and so forth. So, it is it is the role of ITER to engage with all uh, bodies in ASEAN, including with the ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation, uh, to see how. Uh, how this nexus between human rights and peace can be maintained uh, uh, from time to time. In with, but ASEAN sectoral bodies is not only the uh, not uh, the uh, only actors uh, in uh, in ASEAN who have responsibility to promote and protect human rights, but there are a number of uh, the the main obligation rests in the uh, uh, national uh, governments. Uh, and therefore we engage with them, the uh, uh, member states, uh, and we use the ASEAN human rights dialogue uh, to remind um, ASEAN member states and not to be too sensitive about uh, discussing human rights issues because uh, uh, ICHER was there established by them to, to, to work with them how to improve, uh, how to implement a rec recommendation from the UPR or the treaty bodies. 
So this kind of role that I chair uh, that need to be introduced to ASEAN member states and this kind of engagement uh, of the seems to be um, not yet successful, but we are in the process going to that direction. Um, human rights education has been very, very important. Uh, uh, there are a number of initiatives, but still um, it is not mainstream uh, uh, in different uh, schools or uh, universities to have um, uh, uh, human rights in, included in the curriculum. We've seen that uh, some universities initially included human rights, but then because of the lack of interest from the, from the students, um, the, the program was uh, removed. Mm -hmm. So so again, uh, there is a, a, a decreased uh, interest of human rights. Uh, I think the promotion is very important. Uh, having uh, different uh, influencers or uh, um, public figures talking about human rights will attract the interest of uh, uh, of many students because i see i the reason i see this because during the the covid-19 the the number of people students wanted to be doctors and nurses increased and now perhaps with uh, well we are in indonesia now we have a very national uh, scandal <laughs> and perhaps after this uh, number of people want to be the um, uh, lawyers, uh, police officers, or uh, 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 the expert on forensic. So again, uh, because of the uh, uh, having public figures talking eloquently about the topic that attract uh, young people to to be to be part of that kind of uh, uh, discipline. And we need to have more and more human rights activists, human human rights uh, uh, defenders. To be able to speak and come forward uh, using social media or any mainstream media to be able to uh, talk uh, about human rights and to appear as you know not savior of the world but <laughs> to talk about human rights eloquently and and show the contribution to to society i think you Yoon, one of the things that uh needs to be done like what you said to empower um, the citizenry is knowledge of rights and uh, necessarily, I, I think I related earlier with uh, what uh, Professor Salvioli mentioned as uh, knowing the truth, being truth seekers. And I think this is where a lot of, um, you, you don't need to be a human rights activist to know the truth, but it takes one if truth is also suppressed. And uh, I, I use that uh, because we also see in our region that with the suppression of truth uh, as part of uh, truth, justice, and reconciliation, uh, this also leads to conflict because, again, there is that power imbalance. Uh, what I want to ask is, from your opinion, Ajarn Sriprapa and uh, Yuyun, uh, what mechanisms within ASEAN do we have at the moment um, a participant is also asking, can bring about these kinds of accountability measures because, uh, again, uh, in order to achieve sustainable peace, there must be justice. And when we talk of justice, there must be accountability uh, if there are violations or if a duty is not performed, there must be some accountability. Uh, what accountability measures, in, in your opinion, uh, could we rely on within ASEAN? Difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, can, I can go first, Yuyun. Uh, um, I, think, I think there has been existing accountability, accountability system um, at three levels. International level, of course, at the UN, as we know, um, although UN is quite far away from us, uh, but you know, if you look at different cases, complaints sent to the UN Human Rights Mechanism, uh, both charter bodies and treaty bodies, um, at least you know they try to do something. Although they do not have uh, power to uh, fully enforce, you know, their recommendations. It's not decisions, of course, but it's recommendations. 
Although at some point they don't even call recommendations, they call it concluding observations, for example. But at least, you know, they are trying their best to come up with the so-called concluding observations or recommendations for state to follow. Uh, so it's really, it depends now to the second level, which is the national level. At the national level, um, I think um, ASEAN member states are not lacking uh, of national uh, human rights system. Uh, of course, you know, although not all countries in ASEAN are having national human rights institutions in order to monitor the compliance, the human rights abuses um, committed at national level. Uh, but the existing uh, national human rights institutions um, can do a better job. I said can do a better job, um, especially, you know, when it's come to, uh, they can do the better jobs only when they are, when they act independently and making sure that they are holding the government accountable to their act, you know, uh, um, commission or omission. Um, but yeah, this could be problematic, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the imbalance of power and the lack maybe also the lack of independence. I don't want to mention the, you know, the name of the country, but you can imagine, and I have been asking myself, how a National Human Rights Commission in one country of ASEAN member states, you know, currently um, ruled by the military of the coup d'etat, um, how the National Human Rights Commission is working, how actually this commission can make, can hold the government accountable for human rights abuses already committed, you know, since last year. Uh, this, is, this is a real question. I'm not just talking about this one country, but other ASEAN member states. Um, well, I'm not saying that, you know, uh, that uh, uh, countries around the world are having good record. I'm not talking about good record or bad record here, but a good human rights record or bad human rights um, uh, record because every single country has its own human rights problems. But, but uh, I think uh, the, the most important thing is actually about how different country and different institution within, within the country, within state, are uh, addressing human rights abuses, not only addressing which is about protection, but also, you know, pro uh, promotion. We go back to human rights education here. Uh, but, but I think the key is about respecting rights of the people. Uh, we, I feel that our leaders do not have culture of respecting, you know, human rights of the people. Uh, so it's quite hard to hold them accountable uh, despite efforts made by, um, made by national human rights institutions. So here at the national level, international level, the roles of civil societies, the roles of human rights activists, the roles of human rights advocates is extremely important because not only they are expert, you know, in human rights, but they are also dealing with human rights abuses on the ground. So they are up to date and they can act immediately. Um, they, they should be they should be acting independently, you know, of the control of the government, unlike some national human rights institutions here. Another, another level, of course, regional level. We heard uh, from the first speaker about uh, regional human rights uh, system in Inter-America. And we learned that, um, I'm not saying that they are more effective, um, but um, they are more progressive than us in the sense that, you know, they are trying to hold states within the region accountable uh, to human rights abuses. Uh, so what is lacking in this region is not about mechanism per se, because we already have the bodies, we already have human rights mechanism in this region. What we need is actually for those bodies, at least two bodies, ACWC and AISA, um, to, to, I mentioned in my, in my talk already, to act independently, independently, and then making sure that human rights abuses are properly addressed. You know, if you do not do fact findings, if AISHA or an ACWC cannot do investigation, at least, you know, making sure, for example, in the thematic studies, 
you know, some human rights issues are actually brought up, analyzed, and addressed. Um, I think this could be helpful. I was talking about, about interpreting the terms of reference creatively because there are not only one, which is about obtaining information. Yeah, you know, because of course, obtaining information is one of them. Uh, but you have some others, including, well, I'm afraid, you and I'm sorry to say this, seeking mandates from foreign minister uh, and from, you know, secretary general would be quite, quite problematic because they're not going to give you a clear mandate to investigate on any human rights violations occurring, you know, within the member state, unfortunately. Thank you, Ajarn. Uh, your thoughts, Yu Yun? I, I know it's a difficult and sensitive topic in ASEAN, but I think uh, Ajarn actually said uh, said it earlier uh, when she was addressing the question whether do we have an effective mechanism? Not quite yet, and uh, not quite and not yet, but I uh, sense a tone of optimism there because uh, not quite and not yet, <laughs> but I think uh, as as activists, we do know that somehow we'll get there, hopefully sooner than uh, later. What are your thoughts, Yun? So during uh, our uh, ICHA consultation on the implementation of uh, Article 5 of Right to Remedy, uh, member states uh, shared on what they have done in terms of past abuses, past human rights abuses. Uh, a number of initiatives are, are there already, and we found some similarities. Some countries, well, not, not all 10 countries made the presentation, but uh, some countries express the recognition of respecting uh, right to victims, even though I think uh, the right of victims need to be expanded not only on uh, the past of, and gross human rights violation, but beyond that, because ability uh, of us to identify the right of victim will lead us to identify what kind of needs and what kind of uh, support and services uh, for victims. Uh, but anyway, as a first consultation, uh, I, um, I appreciate the level of honesty uh, of member states in sharing what they have done and, and recognizing that uh, human rights, uh, the gross human rights violation happened in the country. And these are some of the efforts. And, and there was a recognition of lacking of uh, uh, implementation here and there, lacking of norms, lacking of legal framework, and so on and so forth. But uh, listening these kind of uh, analysis from member states already a good thing. Uh, and because then we, we, we will be able to identify what kind of uh, uh, intervention uh, may be uh, uh, identified for this. So, um, um not only that um uh, member states recognize right to victims but also right to truth uh and and recognizing uh of non recurrent of the issues there are therefore number of initiatives uh, have been done for instance in cambodia there are number of education uh the curriculum uh, school curriculum has have had been included the Khmer Rouge uh, 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 incidences, and number of countries also have this kind of um, uh, uh, approach. Of course, the views of victims uh, can be different. Uh, they seek for justice. They need they need uh, to hear the truth, uh, especially from the officials, which in some countries until now it is not yet fulfilled. But there are a number of processes uh, uh, on the ground. Um, in 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 recognizing and fulfilling uh, right to remedy for for uh, uh, victims. Now also discuss uh, we discuss about judicial and non judicial remedies. Uh, how we can provide this and the role of uh, uh, non state actors to provide the non judicial um, uh, non judicial uh, um, uh, uh, remedies. Uh, in the in ICHR level, as uh, since we adopted the uh, complaint mechanism, the agenda item we call it agenda item 5.1 on recent development of uh, human rights in the region has been used to 
to discuss about the issue. For instance, I received and from 2019, November 2019, until now I received two uh, complaint mechanism from civil society in relation to human rights uh, situation in Indonesia. So I use this agenda to table the, the discussion and uh, to table the complaint and what I have been doing in response to the issue. As accountability, my accountability to IH representative because the, ish, the the complaint has been sent to uh, the email of ICHR and also send uh, our response to the complainant uh, as accountability from, from uh, ICHR to the complainant. So there are a number of uh, accountability mechanisms that we are uh, 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 experimenting. I'm not saying that this is already an established mechanism, but we are pushing the envelope to be able to uh, have this because Receiving complaint is not in the TOR, but we have it anyway, because we agreed among ourselves. So this is something that also I learned, uh, despite the fact that we don't have the uh, uh, some provision in the TOR, we still can do it as long as we have political will among ourselves to agree by consensus on this uh, uh, point. That is why this kind of uh, opening create more uh, ideas to push to to install uh, in 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 ICHR. Uh, so so these are some of the possibilities. ASEAN Human Rights uh, Dialogue is also another opportunity for us to ask question to member states, uh, like representative from other countries, ask about why you still implement death penalty in your country. Mm -hmm. So this is the question that we cannot ask before. But while we have the platform, then. Uh, we can actually uh, ask this question without being accused of stop here, you uh, violate uh, non-interference principle. So we don't have that kind of uh, argument anymore because the platform has been established by consensus uh, with the inter with the uh, political will of member state. And we would like to maintain this, uh, expand this uh, space uh, to be able to uh, uh, highlight uh, our concerns uh, to show that we are not happy with what happened in your country, and but we we also uh, uh, here to help. So this kind of approach that we would like to have. Uh, 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 while while making the seeking of uh, mandates, um, when saying it in the ASEAN foreign ministers, uh, there has been no expectation to to be approved, <laughs> but. <laughs> It is important to show that we want this because my, uh, my understanding from uh, since I, I joined ICHR in 2019, if we don't say it, uh, 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 foreign ministers thought that we don't need it. So we have to say, it. we like review of the TUR, we mention it uh, all the time. There is one year that we, didn't, we, we did not mention and uh, less mentioned uh, in the ASEAN foreign ministers after that. So it seems like ICHR already gave up on uh, asking for reviewing the TOR. So, so, so I think it is also I learned uh, in, uh, in ASEAN or ICHR, if you continue to mention it, uh, some someday you will get it. <laughs> and that's also the experience of the, the working group you keep asking for it and not knowing when you will get it and finally you get it. <laughs> there is a biblical passage, Yuyun. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. <laughs> but I think uh, this this best shows how uh, the political will that you are mentioning, uh, that uh, even developing consensus within ICHR is difficult enough, but being able to push it further and tell the foreign ministers that uh, this is needed uh, is still an expression of that political will. And I think uh, this addresses a comment or a question of one of our participants, um, particularly asking about how do we deal with uh, that principle of non-interference within ASEAN. And uh, we do know that uh, this principle is brought about by sovereignty. It's not uh, it's not unique within ASEAN. We can see that in the UN. We can see that in uh, different regions. Uh, but I think uh, 
what has been said so far, as mentioned by Ajarn Sriprapa and uh, Yuyun, is that we should not be satisfied with the status quo. Uh, there is always ways of pushing the agenda and pushing the portfolio of human rights. If it's not necessarily allowed, it doesn't mean that you can't um, you, you can't do it by uh, engaging those who are in power and demanding uh, that this be um, this be fulfilled. Uh, earlier in in our first speaker actually mentioned that these are part and parcel of the obligations and duties of states. I think that's also worth mentioning because the the platform that Yuyun has been mentioning so far has also been the platform of dialogue, which is very important in uh, peace and reconciliation. There is a specific question, um, since we're also talking about peace and security, and there's a reference to UN Security Council Resolution Number 1325 on Women, Peace, and Security. The inquiry is, how do you think has this been integrated uh, uh, within ASEAN's efforts for peace and uh, sustainability? Uh, your thoughts, Yuyun, uh, then Acharn? Uh, before going to 1325, if I may uh, to share uh, what I've learned uh, in this uh, in this three years or four years in ICER, um, the about non-interference principle, it is still intact with us. It is still with us in ICER in, in ASEAN, and we have observed uh, the these uh, values. Uh, but if you look at the example provided in the UN, for instance. Article two of the UN Charter talk about non-intervention, but if you look at the truffle, uh, the, the 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 background of the uh, uh, that particular article, they keep talking about non-interference, non-intervention all the time, but still, uh, and it was not in vacuum. It is not an empty space. It was because there are number of concerns about colonialism and con uh, loss of control over territory and so on and so forth. But still, with this article, even there is there is also a UN declaration on on non intervention. Uh, UN still can hold a, a session, a platform in which human rights of a, of countries to be discussed. So, if you see uh, the pattern that shows by the UN, we we can actually draw some of the uh, uh, this pattern first. There should be a commitment in the UN level. It is a form of resolution. And then the resolution talk about modalities, talk about space. And that is why uh, it has uh, UN Human Rights Council before Human Rights Committee was uh, was created part of with these three formulas. And these three formulas, formulas that transform, well, I, I took I took it from, from this UN uh, 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 system. First, we need to talk among ourselves about the need to have a space to discuss about human rights uh, issues of the countries. We also need to agree among ourselves on modalities to make sure that everyone feel comfortable and con feel secured about uh, talking uh, 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 about human rights issues. And the third, there is a space. So we, we will not spill over on discussing these human rights issues in other, uh, 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 in, in other occasions. So this three formulas that I've learned from the UN prove to be effective and applicable to our region. Maybe this is also applicable to other uh, regions. So, so this is perhaps one way to engage with the existing ASEAN norms, so-called uh, non-interference principle. So it is still with us, but we have, it is given for me as a current generation it is given because it's already there even before i was born but so that's but we we should not give up on what what uh the limitation we have so we have to create uh, all uh, uh possibilities all procedures it means we have to do our homework uh in dealing with non-interference principle uh in terms of 1325 uh the discussion has quite has been quite um uh, uh Progressive uh, in ASEAN, 
uh, the ACW, ASEAN Committee on Women, ASEAN uh, Commission on, on the Promotion and Protection of Women and Children uh, have come together uh, and developed the plan of action uh, to implement the uh, women, peace and security. So it's quite a major discussion. Uh, there was, uh, I think in the last three years, uh, the issue of women women in, in security uh, uh, areas uh, had been there for some time and, and uh, it become the major <laughs> development uh, in the region. Very often we do not see women and security uh, because women always in ASEAN, women always uh, put in the social cultural. But now more and more we see uh, the 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 integration between political security and women uh, in the area of women, peace and security. There was also a uh, women uh, leader summit uh, and series of uh, uh, forums and uh, meetings uh, in ASEAN in relation to uh, the issue of women in in three communities. So uh, I think uh, ASEAN websites uh, provide a number of uh, evidence on how uh, ASEAN has been moving too fast uh, on this, too fast in the positive way, very fast uh, uh, in relation to the issue of women and now women in peace and security. Thank you, Yun. Ajarn Sriprapa, would you like to add to that? I would like to add on two things. Um, I'm not expert on gender, but I'm glad to see maybe, you know, Puja uh, can actually jump in here because as far as I understand that AIPR, they got a kind of uh, uh, a working group or task force on, you know, um, uh, women and peace. I'm not quite sure how it exactly called, but um, you know, it's there at AIPR and one of my colleagues from the Institute of Human Rights and Peace Study is actually part of that particular task force or working group on the women and peace, uh, which I think is important and it shows a kind of willingness and efforts you know, made by AIPR to promote the participation of uh, women in peace and security sector, uh, which is which is uh, an important one. Um, although in reality, and I'm taking example of, for example, of example of the existing or current ongoing peace negotiations, you know, between the Thai authorities and the armed groups in Thailand. Um, in the in the peace among the peace negotiators, I don't see you know any women participating in it. Um, I am afraid that you know participation of women in the peace negotiation is really you know um, in the background rather than at the forefront of negotiation itself. Of course, this is the reality, but the efforts are being made you know, by an institution within ASEAN. And uh, in fact, in ASEAN, I think the first declaration which could be interpreted as relating to human rights is actually the ASEAN declaration on um, advancement of women in ASEAN which was adopted in since 1988. And by the advancement of women in ASEAN, it refers to participation of women in politics, which I guess you know, in this case, include participation in peace and security as well. So the documents, the will is there, is really how to properly implementing it. Um, the second point that I'd like to address is about uh, the concept and the practice of non-interference. Non you know, if, you, if you look at the formulation uh, put in the UN Charter and the ASEAN Charter, they are not exactly the same. Because in, in the ASEAN Charter, um, the article uh, put it very clearly and used the term non-interference in internal affairs of member states. So it's very clear is about non-interference in, inter in internal affairs of other states, of, of other member states, 
uh, and it's very unfortunate that until now, uh, you, 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 I guess you cannot deny this, that human rights issues are still perceived as internal affairs of member states. You know, so that's why it is it is quite difficult even for, for human rights body like AISHA to address the, some serious human rights uh, uh, violations uh, happening within the region. Um, in the charter of the United Nations, um, I, I am looking at it and I think um, the um, the article two um, of the the UN Charter um, used the term with the UN Charter. I'm sorry, but uh, the term non-intervention yeah, was actually used. Um, yeah to intervene in meta. So, you know, different term is used here. Um, um, I think there has been attempts to actually to come up with, with what we call con conceptual clarification of what it means by, you know, respect for state sovereignty, non-interference in internal affairs and all those things. I'm, I'm not quite sure where it is now, uh, but at least, you know, all us in member states without any exception has adopted the Vienna, 1993 Vienna Declaration and Plan of Action, uh, which you know, in part four of that particular declaration says very clearly that human rights is not considered as internal affairs. Human rights is actually an international concern. Thank you. Thank you, Ajarn Yu Yun. Maybe I can uh, also invite our colleagues from the ASEAN Institute on uh, Peace and Reconciliation to weigh in on the question regarding women, peace, and security. And I see Ambassador Puja joining us. Pa Puja, would you like to share thank the you. perspectives from IPER? Thank you. Thank, thank you, RP, and, and thank you, Tata Sri Papa, for uh, giving us the opportunity also to respond on the 1325 uh, resolutions. Um, um, indeed, um, in addition to um, our uh, participation in the establishment of the uh, regional plan of actions on the uh, WPS, um, also as you recall, the uh, ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation in 2018 established an ASEAN Women Peace Registry in Cebu, um, the Philippines, which actually is a very monumental um, um, uh, a gathering of, of female um, uh, members of, of our regions who will uh, contribute on the promotions of the uh, WPS um, agenda. Um, um, indeed. Um, uh, secondly, um, of course, they express their interest that uh, their role is not only a tokenism, but they wish to to um, um, uh, involve and play um, uh, more uh, important roles in the promotion of the uh, WPS, not only uh, also on the uh, peace and, and reconciliation in, in our regions. Um, this is, I think, um, why they express their interest also in the future, if uh, they can also play important roles in the uh, mediations uh, processes. Um, if there is a conflict. In the case of uh, the uh, uh, Moro National Liberation Front, um, I believe uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, females, uh, members of delegations of the, of the Philippines who also involve um, in this uh, mediation. And um, uh, thirdly, um, recently the uh, ASEAN IPR um, also um, in the process of um, establishing a module for the uh, WPS. Um, in this case, uh, I wish to invite uh, my colleague Kartika because he is the uh, uh, project management on 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 this um, um, issue on the module on the WPS. Kartika. Uh, thank you, Papuja, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Maybe just to add in to what our executive director has uh, informed. The ASEAN Institute for Peace and Reconciliation is indeed 
part of the drafting of the Regional Plan of Action for Women, Peace and Security. Uh, the RPA uh, is not only aiming at integrating WPS agenda at the regional level, but also advancing WPS agenda at the national level. Uh, maybe that's the first point that I would like to raise. And regarding the modules that was mentioned by our executive director, uh, it is a training program aimed at uh, ASEAN government officials, as the ASEAN IPR is a track 1.5 institute, uh, we would like to provide uh, enhanced capacity to ASEAN government officials to have gender lens uh, when it comes to conflict uh, analysis, conflict resolution and peace building. And through this uh, series of trainings aimed at mid-level and senior level uh, government officials, we hope to provide that uh, capacity for these uh, officials. Uh, right now, the modules are at the pilot testing phase. We hope to implement several uh, pilot trainings uh, throughout uh, this year and the beginning of next year. And hopefully after uh, improvements through our pilot testing, uh, we can then uh, have this series of training as a regular training program provided by the ASEAN IPR. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pak Puja. Thank you, Kartika. Uh, Ajahn Sriprapa, you have uh, a question? You. Yeah, thank you, Abi. It, it's not a question. Um, I'm asking an opportunity from the organizer to actually to share or to advertise that uh, the ASEAN uh, University Network Human Rights and Peace Education, we are preparing for uh, a workshop, a training course. Uh, for university lecturers and for also, we also include officials um, to a training course uh, on peace and conflict transformation. Of course, you know, focusing on uh, South Asia, on ASEAN, and we have experts from, especially from within the region, uh, to share on different issues, including gender, peace, and security as well. Um, the deadline for application is until the end of this month, and the course will be done online, um, you know, in um, mid uh, September. So it's, it's, it's just quite soon from now. Thank you, Abi. Sorry for making use of this particular forum. To do this. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, I think that's a very good segue towards my last question for you and uh, you, Yoon, actually, since uh, there has been a lot of discussions on contentious issues, uh, but there are participants who are very much interested to find out about materials, particularly uh, maybe you could help them. Uh, ask. They're asking, is there a community or a forum based on the web about human rights activists so that uh, the participants in our Zoom webinar right now can be able to collaborate, to reach out, um, to get information and maybe to report human rights violations to get uh, an idea what to do. And uh, there's also one inquiry more particularly on uh, materials on COVID-19 response of uh, ASEAN. So maybe you can uh, give them tips, Ajarn Sriprapa and uh, Yuyun, and uh, maybe even Pak Puja on where they could uh, get information. I may not touch upon, you know, uh, the issue of uh, network um, because I'm dealing more with the um, university network here. Uh, and of course, you know, the network of like-minded uh, people like the working group for an ASEAN voice mechanism um, as the co-chair of the working group. But, but just want to share two things about materials. One, you can see my virtual background, which is the uh, reading materials, the sources, um, uh, which are the textbook. If you know the uh, the person who asked the question is a student, then you can download from the Chipsy website. Um, RP, maybe you type you know Chipsy uh, there um, in the chat so that they can look at. Um, you know, materials that uh, you see from the background, virtual background behind me um, are actually available on Shepsi website and all AUN um, website as well that you can download free of charge is the Creative Commons 
uh, we we produce the fourth series of um, human rights and peace reading materials. Um, and the fourth one is about a conflict, peace and conflict transformation in South Asia. The fifth one that we are currently preparing is human rights and environment and climate change. Um, and is, you know, is, um, we are currently preparing on it. Um, the second one I saw on Q&A, um, I was uh, talking about the ASEAN comprehensive framework um, in responding to uh, the impacts of COVID-19. Um, in fact, you know, you can look at the ASEAN website, uh, ASEAN.org, in order for you to download the work plan uh, activities. Um, uh, you've got, actually, it's uh, uh, also free of charge. But of course, you know, the analysis, academic papers um, on the impacts of COVID-19, um, there are quite many of them. Um, you just go to, um, you just Google you find long lists of you know of papers um i was writing some papers um under revision um the one that I was presenting was actually prepared for this particular uh, for this particular forum so it's not published yet thank you ajahn sri papa uh yuyun any tips yes, yeah <laughs> it's already mentioned by ajahn sri papa uh, but for the network um they uh, some some groups use facebook groups or clubhouse if you have iphone uh, you have access to clubhouse discussion uh there is no in in so far so far as i understood uh, there is no specific uh, group very very broad on uh, human rights uh, online they focus more on themes so for instance those who are working on the enforced disappearances will come together into one group uh, migration into one group because we cannot discuss about all human rights issues in detail in one group that's too much uh, so i suggest if you look for uh, internet based uh, grouping or network uh, uh, this uh, so pick certain issues but at a personal level, usually activists, because of the increase of security, uh, they come to WhatsApp group <laughs> or Telegram group or any group based on phones because, because uh, they know each other. Uh, so be, usually when, when uh, it comes to personal grouping, uh, the discussion may be very detailed and it's very often uh, quite confidential. But if you just to gain uh, some kind of uh, information, uh, report, the newest report uh, that published. Uh, there are a number of groups in Facebook. Uh, well, I may, uh, I understand, uh, as well as in clubhouses. I'm not sure whether Twitter has a, has group <laughs> or Instagram has group. I don't know. I do not know. I only know that first group, uh, Facebook groups uh, uh, also exist uh, in terms of uh, people interesting on the issue of human rights coming together. Thank you. And we have already exhausted our time for this session for this afternoon. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank our, again, distinguished speakers. We had Mr. Fabian Salvioli, this UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion of Truth, Justice, Reparation, and Guarantees of Non-Recurrence, Her Excellency Wayuning Rum, who is the representative of Indonesia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, and Dr. Sriprapa Pecharamesri, advisor of the Institute of Human Rights and the Peace Studies of Mahidol University. When we started uh, this afternoon, we had a discussion on peace and human rights. And there was a question of whether peace is an element of human rights or whether human rights is needed for peace. But I think in the discussions, we had to move from that concept towards something more concrete. But what is clear is that there could be no justice and, hum and human rights. There could be no human rights without justice, and justice definitely has to be based on human rights. So what does that mean? 
when we talk of justice, our first speaker gave five elements to guide us. One is truth. Second one is justice itself, which means accountability, being able to prosecute and punish. The third is reconciliation. Fourth is reparation. And fifth is the memorialization so that there won't be any recurrence of all of these issues. But when we situate ourselves right now in the discussion of peace and human rights within ASEAN, we do find out that there are mechanisms that are already in place. The question is, are these mechanisms effective at the moment? And this is where our speakers, second and third speakers, weighed in that maybe it might not be effective at the moment, but definitely there are efforts to push towards having more effective mechanisms. It's not as easy as it sounds, but definitely with the platforms for engagement and discussions like these, it's all about dialogue and being able to act based on our knowledge of what are the duties and obligations of the states. So ultimately, we had that discussion on challenges and issues, and I do hope that uh, we ended with a positive note that we are rest assured that we have advocates all over the room, whether you are in government, in the academe, in the NGO, in CSO, or whether you are students, we have roles to play in order to move towards a more effective mechanism that we want on human rights promotion, protection, and on uh, attaining the sustainable peace that we want. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our MC, Kartika. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss. Thank you, Sir RP, for moderating this afternoon's discussion. Uh, we will also like to thank our distinguished speakers for their time, for the presentations, and for answering the questions posed by the audience. Now, the organizer has shared a link for the e-certificate to this webinar. Uh, the link is in the chat box for participants in Zoom. If you are having difficulties in opening the link, please refer to the email listed. Uh, it is now on the chat box as well. Now, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this discussion series session. We express our sincere appreciation to all attendees in Zoom and viewers on YouTube who have followed the discussion from beginning to end. And you can review the discussion that has taken place this afternoon on the ASEAN IPR's YouTube channel. So it is uh, available now because it's a live stream event. We hope you will be able to join our next discussion series session and keep a close eye on our social media platforms for information on the next theme we will discuss. In the meantime, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you, Ajahn, Sri Papa. Thank you, Ms. Wahyu Ningrum. And thank you, Sir RP. Thank you. Yeah, Salamat. Thank you. Tika, so formal with the Sir RP. What's that? <laughs> Salamat, RP. My pleasure. Kapung crap, kapung crap. Nice seeing you, Ajahn. Nice seeing you, Yoon. Yeah. Thank you so Thank you much. Everyone. See you. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye bye. See you again. Hopefully in Manila. Hopefully. Let me know. <laughs> or in the Hague program. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Or there in Jakarta. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, yes. Come visit us. I'll okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, all attendees. Thank you very much. Dan Bukartika, thank you. Thank you, Paidi. Senai PR colleagues, you may now uh, shut down the webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>